we've been talking a lot about digital twins and Tor has given a very brief introduction already. Um, and uh, before we start uh, uh, talking with the SMEs, I'd like everyone to have the same kind of common understanding of what we're actually talking about. Um, so to do this, I've prepared this uh, set of sheets. Um, they will not be too technical, but uh, I hope everyone can follow along. So first, uh, very briefly about myself. I'm a business consultant at TNO, and I currently lead the research team on digital twinning. I've been working with digital twins for 15 years so far, and also been involved with digitalization with companies uh, yeah, all, all my career. And I'm the technical co coordinator on Change to Twin. Um, and so this is already an interesting statement, uh, 15 years already doing digital twinning. So I don't think digital twinning is actually something new. It's something old that we have called a new name. And uh, I, will, I will explain more about that later. So what I hope after this, this session of this coming hour, I hope you will all have a basic understanding of what are we talking about in a digital twin, how digital twinning fits into the smart industry and the manufacturing process, how you can explain digital twins to SMEs, and also I will provide um, a brief introduction to the seven step method to make a twinning plan. Uh, because uh, knowing what a twin can do is one thing, but then also knowing how to implement one is another. So first I'll provide a little bit of context uh, in terms of smart industry or industry 4.0, then I'll uh, discuss the actual definition of what is a digital twin and explain digital twins. Then I'll tackle some of um, some industry examples very briefly and go through the seven step method, how you can help in creating an actual digital twin plan. So first, um, also some organizational information. All of the documents are available. Also, this presentation is available in the community space. If you have any questions, just put them in a the chat, chat box and hopefully Florence or Martella can pick them up and, and interrupt me and uh, make the questions happen. And if you want to contact me, of course, here's the generic change to tune address. And um, yeah, I'll see if we can replace that maybe with the digital twin at change to twin or something else, but uh, that's for the future. All right. Then the introduction to smart industry first and digital twins. So what are we talking about with smart industry or digital twins first? Yeah. Um, so I put some images of partners that are on board in the consortium in this sheet just to provide some illustration. Um, and Perspective is a very nice uh, software where you can model, uh, no, represent the actual physical um, part in your factory in a digital way. And this is just an illustration of what they're doing. Also the PLM system by Jotna, where you can have model calculations on, for example, aer aeroplane parts. And um, at the right is actually a, a more of a stock photo image where you can compare the real engine with the virtual engine. And at the bottom, also something similar, but then in, in metal working, how you go from let's say, a, a piece of bare metal to the actual product and how do, do the fiscal and digital worlds come together? Because that's what the digital twin is all about. How do the digital worlds and the fiscal worlds get together? And to get a kind of illustration for this, I have a short video just, you know, to, to get acquainted with the ideas. And that's this one. And what you see here is on the right, the real world and on the left, the virtual world. And the challenge here was for the, the maker of this, um, and that's actually a, a company called Scale. They are doing modeling. Um, they wanted to know, can our simulation be accurate enough that it actually represents and is aligned with the reality? And as you can see, the cars break up almost in a similar fashion on the both on the right and on the left. So they are very similar. 
And that means that the virtual representation, so the digital simulation is actually accurate enough that it can uh, represent the physical world. And why would you do this? Well, of course, um, there's crash testing for cars a lot, but if you can replace 80% of all the crash testing by doing the calculations before you do the actual crash test, um, you will save a lot of cars uh, that have been crashed and a lot of effort uh, to test and evaluate the actual performance. Um, and that's a similar thing I also did with digital twins uh, in other areas um, where it's too expensive to just break the machine to test something. And then if you can do that virtually, it makes a lot more sense. And this is just one of the examples where you can use a digital twin. Um, so it's again, physical and virtual world coming together. All right, so then smart industry. Um, because we're talking about manufacturing companies, manufacturing SMEs, um, smart industry is a big aspect here. And smart industry stands for three main transitions and it's actually about digitalization and it's about connecting products, machines and people and the use of new production technology. And these three combined make up smart industry. And that's still a container, right? It's still vague. You can go all kinds of directions. And in the Netherlands, where my company is based, um, we have a national smart industry program and they uh, decided on having eight focus areas that are to do with these transitions. And then you can talk about certification or the digital factory or uh, smart work, um, flexible manufacturing. And these are, they, these make more sense. These are like well-known terms in manufacturing. And uh, if I look at digital twins, they are also uh, used in most of these aspects. And of course, uh, when we're talking about smart industry, there's all kinds of promise there. And I'm, uh, I've just highlighted a couple here as some of these benefits that you can actually get. And uh, we talk about these a lot, uh, especially uh, in the Netherlands. I have many um, um, conversations with both SMEs and more larger companies discussing these and how to make these happen. And the biggest uh, issue I have here um, is if we speak about digitalization, so that's actually the process of applying digital technology in all of your company's processes. And that's a very big challenge. And I think this is the baseline that Nuno has discussed in his sheets. Uh, where he said, we're expecting minimally level two, but preferably level three. And that's based on the uh, German uh, re research. And uh, they've put the maturity levels of smart industry in a kind of graph like this. That's a graph you see here. And we made some small adaptations. Um, so if you do everything manually at your company, actually you're at level zero. Um, because every, everything is done by hand, everything is not digital, everything is done uh, manually. Of course, that's long gone, right? Uh, most uh, companies are way beyond that stage. Uh, nowadays, we all use computers and IT systems um, uh, to uh, uh, log what we're doing, um, uh, save our orders, do some processing. We have some simulation uh, or work preparation software. We have cut design softwares, all kinds of software. But what I see mostly is that they are used in isolation in companies. So all of these softwares are used separately. And then the big step is if you can connect them with each other, you will have data exchange between these software systems and the business applications. And then you're actually at level two. And just to give an example, um, uh, what if a company uh, gets an, receives an order through their web portal, it gets logged into the ERP system automatically, um, maybe the, the work preparation uh, and the order will get planned automatically, and then the right instructions for the machine making the actual product also automatically get connected into the machine. And the machine is reporting its progress and it's reporting its um, I would say, uh, for example, sensor values. And then you can go into the 
monitoring stage where you can use all of this information, keep track of what's going on and have real time information about the business processes. And if you have this information, you can get to the next level and understand what's going on in your company based on data, uh, see if something is going wrong, uh, interact with the business process to, to prevent something from happening. All of this, these things are now possible if you're at level four. And if you have a good grasp of this and you can actually predict what's going to happen within the next hour or maybe tomorrow or next week, then you can actually have some predictive capacity and you can maybe run simulations to prevent something from happening. And then at the last stage, there's the adaptability and that it's not done just by doing um, simulations for the future, but you have a continuous learning cycle in how you can adapt to new changes and new situations. Um, and that's the, the, let's say, highest level currently achievable, what we, what we know. And so smart industry is actually tying things together. So it's tying the IT systems together with the people making it and with the machines making it. So these three now come together. And that's a big change in terms of how we think about industry and manufacturing. All right, and if we're talking about digital twinning, it's actually happening mostly at the right side of this maturity index. So what Nuno said with preferably level three, it makes sense because if you have no data, it's very hard to align the digital and virtual world. Um, if you have no simulation model, uh, it's gonna be very hard to get an actual representation of, of what you have in the factory. Um, uh, uh, so this is the area where digital twinning is happening. And what I see a lot uh, in companies when I speak with them, and I would call this a big barrier, is I speak a lot with companies about how to make this autonomous factory that it's self-learning and uh, uses AI and all kinds of interesting things that can happen. But when I actually ask and what's going on, mostly they are just starting. So they just have the isolated computer systems and are just learning how to connect them to each other. And so the big barrier I see is getting companies, SMEs from step one and two to actual level three so we can actually use and, and um, adopt the digital twinning technology in SMEs. And you might think this is the case for just SMEs because uh, manufacturing is lagging in digitalization a bit. If I see the reports on European level, this is also the case for the multinationals. And even though some parts of the multinationals might be at the higher level, for example, level four, most of the company is still at level one of two. Um, so it's not just SMEs, it's also the larger companies struggling to make this happen. So uh, I just wanted to highlight this as a kind of success story. And this is Sandvik. They've been selected by the EU as being a lighthouse on smart industry. And they put up some nice YouTube videos and I, I picked a snippet from this YouTube video to <coughs> illustrate how they think in connecting all these different parts in their company together. Uh, the reason was what we like to call our digital thread. The digital thread is a concept uh, for how we have uh, optimized uh, design, production preparation and production itself, and how we can also feed back information from production to our systems. So we collect a lot of data from our machines and processes, uh, both from control systems and sensors in the machines. We are also uh, implementing software for collision detection and uh, machine learning, which will uh, further help us to use the data. So in this factory alone, we make almost 15,000 standard articles. And instead of making 3D models and drawings for each and every one of them, we use parametric design so that we can automate the design, which in turn lets us automate the whole chain all the way to production. So all right, so what they've done is actually link together all of their processes in the factory to go from the initial design of a part to the actual delivery to a client and every single part of 
of the whole production process is connected with each other. And that enables them to keep track of what's going on, better automate some parts, and have better insights in what's going on. I see a question coming up on scope of sensors on the maturity level, so I'll go back here. Um, so uh, the role of these sensors can, can be very different. Uh, so um, what I see, for example, in, in machines, and I'm now focusing on machines, right? So for example, um, if you have a production process and it's um, related to, let's say, environmental conditions like temperature or humidity or some other aspects, and these secretly influence your production, your product quality. Um, <clears throat> you will need to connect the sensors in the on the let's say shop floor or in the factory uh, to the sensors in the machine to align this quality. Maybe you need to raise the temperature a little bit or uh, um, in the production machine to make the a better quality product. Uh, what I also have seen with companies is vibration sensors. And these vibration sensors uh, can measure the um, uh, de degradation of parts in the machine. Uh, so that if it vibrates in a, in a strange way, you know some parts need to be replaced. So that's used for predictive maintenance. And there can be many, many more, and I will come back to that later a little bit. Uh, All right, so then a digital twin, a definition and some detailed explanation. So um, we're currently using this definition. So a digital twin is a digital replica that is accurate enough that it can be the basis for decisions given a specific purpose. Um, so the replica part, that's the virtual or the digital part. And it's of something that is physical. And it should be accurate enough that I can actually make decisions. Because if I'm not making a decision, the digital twin will not be worth it. And usually we make decisions with goals in mind. And that's what we call purpose here. <laughs> so, um, for example, anyone can do uh, a nice good simulation. But if the simulation is not used in a business process, or decisions aren't made based on the simulations we do, then why are we doing the simulation at all? And that's the first thing I notice um, when we talk about digital twinning. I see a lot of people saying, ah, oh, there's interesting technology, we need sensors, we need data, we need a model, we're gonna do all this infrastructure and make it happen. And then somehow we are forgetting that we're actually trying to achieve a goal. And for me, this goal is key. Because without this goal, the whole twinning process is not going to be valuable for the SME. And so this goal should be creating the actual value for the company. And how we do it is by linking the data models and processes together. And, and so this for me is the, the, the definition part. And what I see is that this replica, what that we're talking about, this digital or simulation, um, is connected by streams of data to keep it real time. And it's aided by all kinds of new IT technology. And to go into this new IT technology part, I'll have a short slide to illustrate that. Oh. So what's changed since the past? Computers are faster, so we can do many, many, many more calculations than before. So like I said, digital twinning is not new. It's something we've been doing for 20, 30 years already. It's just we can somehow do more right now than we could do before. And not just the computers are faster, also our methodology for calc doing calculations have become smarter. So we can actually do more types of calculations. And at the same time, there's also more tools available. So we can model things easier and faster in a, in a better way. And also people with less uh, skill can actually do the work. And through IoT, as has been said about sensors, more data is now available than ever before. And at the same time, there's also more proven examples. 
So before it was all, okay, so there's this interesting concept of digital twin, but now there's actually proven examples where we have uh, actual validation of results, we have actual validation of value, and we actually have better accuracy. So all of these things are happening, and that makes the time, I would say the time is now for digital twins to be adopted, because it's actually feasible right now. Um, so coming back to these key elements of a digital twin, I'd like to discuss the example I put in here with the, car, the two cars. And just to illustrate why these things are, are so important. So what's the purpose of this video? What's the purpose of doing this simulation? Is that by not wrecking cars and doing lots of the calculations um, um, digitally before we actually wreck the car? Or is that, should we design this door uh, with a slightly heavier metal so it's becoming sturdier? Or is it, how can we optimize the layout of the parts so that we have a better uh, friction zone? Um, or is the purpose to just create a nice PR video that will uh, be, go viral on LinkedIn and sell our product. Uh, all of these things are viable pur purposes, but each of them requires a different implementation of the actual digital twin. And that's, I think, a big aspect of what your work as digital innovation hubs will be uh, to figure this out, this, this purpose together with the SME. Why do they want the digital twin? How can that actually help their business? And, and how that, will that create value? And that's, I think, the biggest question you should ask. Because technically, uh, uh, there's all kinds of sensors available. You can all get all kinds of data. You can make models. That's all possible. But if they don't see why they should do it, uh, that's the really tough aspect. And um, what I also like here in this video, that this video isn't actual cars. This video is about Lego cars. So they actually used Lego parts. And each of these Lego parts in this video has been individually calculated to see if they break, what the friction is. So there's, this is actually a high physics simulation where each physical aspect of the individual parts are cal calculated. Um, so just to give an impression, I think there is about a uh, hundred million calculations being done just in this single video, just on the basic Lego parts. And, and, but we can see it, we can see that it works, we can see that it happens, and we can see and understand that it's accurate. So then there's types of twins, and that's what I've already been explaining a bit. Um, um, what I see if I look at the life cycle or of the type of what we are actually twinning, I see some differences happening. So we can make a digital twin of the product that we're making, or we can have a digital twin of the production making a product. And these two are very different things and require very different types of implementations. And at the same time, I also see a difference in, are we designing something? So are we, is it like the R&D phase of a, of a product or a production machine? Or is it something that is in operation? And that's also a very different approach in terms of digital twin. And for each of these four, I will have an example later on. So then at the same time also, given these purposes, can we define common purposes that we see in manufacturing company, companies? And that can be the virtual design, so where we're actually designing something, where we are creating, let's say, customer engagement, so seeing the product in 3D and seeing how it operates and what it actually does. That's also a kind of twin that, that you can sell um, and use for PR or for sales. Or the commissioning, where you go to the uh, factory and prep the new machine to be installed, but you can do most of the work already from your office because if you can do it 
virtually. You don't actually have to go to the factory site. You can just do it remotely. And also feedback to engineering. Um, at, so that you have something designed, it's produced, and now you discover something. And can you then provide feedback to the engineers who've done the R&D process so that the next iteration of the product can actually improve? Or where you have a simulation of what's going on during operation, and that's called the monitoring, and you can actually compare the twin with your uh, real um, uh, machine. Are they operating in the same way? Are there any differences? Is anything weird going on? And I just had a talk yesterday with the company and they said, um, uh, we now have a kind of AI trained on the data coming from the machine. And the AI tells us if anything out of the ordinary happens. And then we send a team to discover what's actually happening inside the machine because they don't know yet. They just know that something weird is happening. Um, and then you can also use the same kind of data and uh, to optimize your production process or optimize your quality of the product. And so if you look at the wider range, so not just the machine or the product, uh, you can also discuss planning. Which kind of materials do I need at which stage in the production process? How are AGVs going through my manufacturing floor? Um, uh, how do we do the logistics? And that's also another part um, uh, uh, for the actual manufacturing process. And uh, what I said with the other part, um, so diagnosis, so having the data available, I can actually check and see, sorry, there's echo. Frank Doyle, can you mute the, yeah, great. Um, so if you use the same kind of data for diagnosis to see what's happening inside the machine and actually uh, determine which part is breaking or failing or uh, misbehaving, and then you can transfer that knowledge to the maintenance and actually do the work. Uh, and there you can do predictive maintenance, for example. And um, a new trend I see, and we just added this, I think uh, just before Christmas, is the smart systems where you actually sell the digital twin along with your product so that your clients can use that digital twin um, um, uh, in, in, with the product that you've sold it to them and uh, do simulations themselves instead of you doing it for them. So that's just an overview of kinds of purposes that are there. Um, it's not just one or the other, there, there's probably some mixes there, but these are the common things we see in manufacturing right now. So I've also put these purposes in the life cycle, um, where in the, uh, in the whole life cycle process, I see most of these purposes happening. So for example, in the design, of course, you have the virtual design part. In the commissioning, you have the commissioning purpose. But in the operational phase, we have monitoring, optimization, diagnosis, how all of these are happening. And of course, <coughs> maintenance is uh, something scheduled, but it's kind of also during the operation phase. And at the top, I've put some purposes that are generic, so they're not part of this, this life cycles. Uh, you, can, you can use them anywhere in the life cycle just to uh, provide some illustrations here. So then coming back to the accurate enough part, um, um, what I see in digital twins is many different levels of abstraction. So are we talking about a digital twin for a single part in the machine or are we talking about the whole factory? And those two are very different things in terms of uh, abstraction and also how they relate to these purposes. And the other part which I see is the complexity. So is the digital twin just providing a simple model or some description? Or do we, for example, like with the Lego cars we just saw, do an actual full physics simulation where we actually do the, the breaking of plastic simulations? Um, and that's a very big difference in types of uh, um, uh, what you can do because the full physics simulation, yes, we can do more, but doing the full physics simulation of the entire factory, no, that's not feasible. Um, 
And so there's a balance between these two. So if you want to model the whole factory, probably it will be a more simple model or maybe uh, something that you validated. Um, and if you want to do a machine or a component, then you can actually have something that, that it goes more into the whole full physics. So there's a balance here. So two main takeaways here. Um, so coming back to these barriers, having the right level of digitalization to make these twins happen is very important. And the other part that's really important is knowing how to apply these twins with purpose and actually create value. So the right side, we can work, do this together and make it work for the SME. The left side is, I would say, the second voucher doing the actual implementation, and that's hard work. So this digital baseline, um, I think, Nuno, maybe you already phrased it even better than I did. Um, um, and so we need data models and the business process to link together. And just to give some examples, data from ERP, machines, or software that is somehow exchangeable. Um, models, and that can be anything. So this representation, I haven't said what this representation actually is. It can be an algorithm, um, a statistics, an AI, um, a physics model, anything is possible because we don't specify this. Uh, but it should provide new insights. Uh, and that's the purposes we've talked about. And in terms of the company process, um, it has to relate to the actual process happening in the factory, whether that's R&D or whether that's just manufacturing parts, operations or work preparation, anything, it has to tie in. <coughs> and um, there's nothing more useless than a dashboard where, when nobody's looking at it. So for me, if I talk about digitalization, smart industry and digital twinning, for me, that's about digitally empowering your employees. And now I'm speaking for the SMEs. Um, so it should drive their empowerment. And how I see it, there's two options. Either you have a factory, an, a, a factory that has... Sorry, I see, yeah. Ismail, can you mute your microphone? Um, so there's a, a two types of stories here. Um, one is the future of the factory with lights out. And there's only two things in a factory. Everything is running autonomously. Um, there's no personnel and there's just a dog. And the dog is keeping the people out. Um, right, and, but the dog needs to be fed. So there's this one guy who's, who sits there in the factory, he lives there and he, his only purpose is to feed the dog. So that's not the type of, of company uh, or future I, I would prefer. But uh, uh, I, I see this, there's a choice uh, happening. Um, because if you then need to do something in a factory because something's broken or something fails, who then actually has the expertise to make it happen? Would we not prefer to have employees that can actually do their work better um, um, uh, and be able to fix them, uh, the factory themselves? And I've had these two types of companies interact with me in the several sessions where uh, the one saying, I'm trying to raise the digital level of my employees, he actually was able to hire more people and work more efficient and produce more while the other person who was aiming for the lights out actually declined. And of course, this is just a sample, but for me, this is kind of interesting to see if you're using it for the benefit of your employees, I think you will actually create good value in your company. So then some examples. So this is a production line for bottles. And we did some exp experimentations where the robot is by itself seeing the environment, interpreting the environment, deciding how to move by itself without any pre-planned operations. Uh, so this, of course, this robot is not self-aware, but he's able to do his task 
without any human intervention. And that's because if humans would do this work, um, it, if we drop a bottle, the glass will be flying all around, the, the production needs to be stopped, and we will have big issues in this production line. Um, but if we were would need to pre-program each pickup of this bottle in the robot, um, we, it would not, not be feasible. Um, so actually, this helped raise the uh, experience level of the personnel in the factory that is operating this robot and to make them more aware of how this robot can function in a high speed bottle production line <laughs> and how they can actually innovate to make this pro, uh, robot become, let's say, adaptive to its environment. So this is an example of the maturity level six that we see here. Another example, um, and that's uh, something that's been done in terms of measuring quality. So this is about 3D printing products. And can we use um, simple, let's say, cameras to create a 3D image of this 3D printed object and then compare it with the actual design and see where is the actual differences between what we designed and what we actually 3D printed. And which part of the 3D printing process is actually influencing this uh, quality metric. So that's an, and so here we're combining two aspects. One is the monitoring part and one's the optimization and quality part. Another example, and that this is for maintenance and you see uh, this person having a HoloLens and he's removing a part from a large machine and he's actually receiving instructions um, through the HoloLens so that he actually knows what he needs to do, what the next step is going to be, and you can actually also see that there is a digital representation of the actual operation that he needs to perform. So now coming back to manufacturing again, um, I really like this image. Uh, this is not mine, I find it on Google, um, uh, but I thought this was a really good example of how virtual and digital meet. And to me, this raises all kinds of questions. And this is actually the question I would like you to ask with the SME. So what are we going to twin? Are we going to twin the machine or the design or the process of the tool or or are we going to twin tools or the material quality um we can do all kinds of things with this image and which is crucial for the sme so i want them to select which of these are actually important for them and hopefully we can have a discussion together and say ah this is really important for me because if I can achieve this, it will generate a lot of money for me, because in the end, that's what it's all about. So just some illustrations of applications you can make. Um, can, can you have some traceable information on material? Can you do co-design or product certification? Um, can you speed up the make to order or can you adapt to new materials? All kinds of things that are relevant for this company. Jeroen, we cannot hear you. We lost you for a, for a moment. We are going to wait for a moment. I think we lost him. Yes, I think he is gonna, he's going to... To reconnect and, and maybe could continue his presentation. Do not hesitate to, to ask a question in the chat and uh, we will... Uh, we will ask them to Jeroen when he, he will be he will be there.
Um, I just called Jeroen. Um, he's trying to get back in. So he'll be back in, I hope, a minute. Great. Thank you, Peter. All right, am I back? Great. Yes. Oh, thank God. <laughs> All right. You can still see my screen? Yes. You you can you can see it. Okay. Yes, but uh we lost you uh on the screen before, so maybe you can come back one slide. Yes, exactly. All right. Okay, here, yeah. So, as you show this screen, uh, we lost you. Okay. Uh, so, you heard what I said here? Not really, not really. You just ah, okay, uh, okay, okay. show this screen okay. and you disappeared. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I, I could hear you, but somehow um, anything from my side was not getting through to you. But uh, I'm happy we're all back on track. Uh, okay, so... Um, I'm trying to, uh, yeah. Uh, so what to twin here actually is a discussion I'm expecting you to have with the SMEs. And then also to discuss how will it fit into their business process. So here I'm actually saying applications and not digital twins. Because the digital twin is a means, it's not a goal by itself. And uh, the digital twin should be part of some other applications because the output from the digital twin should feed into some business process. And so here I listed some kinds of some some examples of applications, um, uh, just to illustrate, let's say, uh, how you where you could use the twin and what kind of application would then be possible. All right. Um, and for that, I also had this uh, table earlier, and I have four examples for each part of the table. Um, and so for design and operation and for product and production. Um, and I'll, I'll go through this very briefly, because later on you will get an in-depth example from um, Perspective and Jodne. Right, so collaborative design. Um, and for me, this is when you're actually, uh, what I see a lot is you do an order, you upload some kind of cut file, and there needs to be some adjustments to make it feasible for production. And so you need to work together. How are you going to work together uh, and share this data? And then um, I think you will need some, some software to connect both of your respective companies together. And then the <coughs> cut model is the actual kind of, uh, that's the data that you need to share. And um, any changes you make, you need to somehow version and make a decision on what will be the final product that you're actually making. And that's just not just between clients and, and companies, but also within the company, because you might have many different departments working on the same thing. And then the ground truth is your actual 3D model of the end, actual end product. And by itself, the cut model is not a twin, um, but it can be data that you actually feed into the twin to get some new insights. Ah, oh. interesting. Uh, can I do that here? I will, I will change it. I made these sheets hidden because I didn't know if I would have time to discuss them. Uh, and similarly, uh, what I see in companies is, for example, the machine here on the top right. Uh, that's actually a machine that's modeled using parametric design. So you can specify 
how many bottles do you want to have produced or how long how many compartments do it does it need to have how many different types of bottles need to go through the machine and it will automatically adjust the parts and modules um, and adjust the actual cut drawing to make the machine happen. And at the bottom left, uh, what I see also is some AI technologies to do actual redesign of parts, where each part is a unique uh, element in the whole uh, 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 end product. And you can have some different optimization schemes where you use the digital twin actually to create optimization runs to see how strong parts are, if they need to be strengthened, which layout would actually have a less steel and better structural strength. And so that's also a line of thinking there. Um, another part is simulating the production process. So for example, here we have uh, some uh, sheet metal with uh, a bend and how will it bend and how you will you operate it and then you can also get some metrics from the machine to see okay i need to set up the right parameters it needs to be the right quality inspection needs to be configured and then compared with what i designed is the actual product similar to what i designed and here another example and this is a welding robot uh, where they can do all the calculations for the whole welding process virtually and then see if it's feasible and if it's feasible they can then do the actual welding uh, by the press of a button to make it happen uh, this is a very different type of uh, twin i would say this is more in terms of how is my business process running is it on par, uh, am I expecting any delays in my uh, business process? And can I actually inform my customer in the right way and predict when he will get the delivery of his goods? And if there's any disturbances in the production flow, can I then deal with it and still make the delivery happen? Or should I actually uh, inform the client that he will be delayed or maybe even uh, on the other side, uh, get this product earlier. Um, another part is then actually the other way around. So not just uh, with your clients, but on the production floor, um, can you get good insight on how your production is going? If you need to make any adjustments, um, if your operators need to do anything and have a good overview there of what's currently going on in the factory. And lastly, in a brief example on predictive maintenance. So there's, I see two examples with companies uh, to improve your actual uptime so that the machine actually runs for longer uh, without uh, less uh, downtime. And the other part is reducing the actual service cost. And that can also include refurbishing a part with uh, improved parts so that it will fail less likely the next time. So these are all kinds of applications where you can use the twin. All right, then we have the seven step method. This is the last part of my talk. And uh, doing this with many companies, uh, we came to a kind of methodology uh, that has seven steps. And as you can guess, uh, it starts with why you want to have a di digital twin. And this is also the part where uh, during this afternoon, uh, it will mainly focus on this part. Um, and this is actually driving your purpose. And so what will it do in your, in, your, in your factory? What will you get out of the digital twin? How can you tie it to your business process and which value can you then create? And only then can you do step two, because that's saying uh, of what do you need to make this twin? So which parts? Is that a machine or a product or just a part of a machine uh, or part of a product? Or is that maybe the factory floor? Um, it can be anything, but you need to select it because otherwise you, you can't scope and it has to tie in with what you're trying, trying to achieve with your purpose. Um, then... <laughs> it's about 
do you have the right infrastructure? Um, 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 so, uh, do you have software that can capture the data? Do you have software that can run the models? Um, do you have software that can bring this together? And can you actually enable the flow of information through your factory? <laughs> then step four is the actual twin building. So going from the physical to the digital, um, uh, creating the actual model that represents what you're trying to do. Because in the end, the digital twin is the model that makes this happen. And what I see with the companies is um, given different purposes, they will have different models of the same part. Um, and because if you want to know the temperature spread of the structural strength of a part, that's something else than um, how fast it moves within the machine. Those two are separate things and separate models. Um, so this twin building part, this is the heart of what digital twinning is about. And then the next part is connecting your twin to the actual operation. Um, so making the results from the twin valuable. And then, of course, in step six, uh, connecting it to the business. So how are people going to use this information? Which decisions are they going to make? And how can they then create the actual value? And then the last step we put in here is um, something will definitely change in the context. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, so, some, some mechanic will change a part of the machine or someone decides, oh, I found this new algorithm or this new improvement to the model. How will you keep your digital twin alive and sustainable so that it's not just a single model that you just create once, but that in the future you can, if any changes happen, you can adapt your model with these changes. Uh, so that's the last part. Uh, my colleague will give some more ex ex uh, detailed explanation of these steps tomorrow morning and also link this with uh, the baseline of um, uh, what you need to have for the purposes to make the digital twin happen. All right, um, I have some of these. Yeah, so then summary for today, I hope uh, you've all seen that the digital twin is actually a model for a specific purpose and that is making a decision for your process. It's good enough that you can make a decision so you trust the outcome of the model and it's based on data. So that's what we talked about what the digital twin actually is. And it uses new IT technology. And they require a baseline and digitalization to work and they require understanding of how to create value given the purpose. And there are many different types of twins, design, operational, product, production. They all have different purposes and different created value. And what we see is if you use these seven steps, you cover your basis and you can actually make a good plan happen. And uh, yeah, so, I hope now you all know what a digital twin is, um, how digital twinning fits into smart industry, how you can explain digital twins to SMEs, and how you can use the seven step method to make a digital twinning plan. And then I think it's time for questions. Thank you, Jeroen, for your presentations. Um, I, I am going to tell you some of the first questions. Uh, the first one was from Jan Terlingen uh, regarding the beginning of your presentation on slide 11, I think. Um, yeah. On the graph, uh, the question was in level three, what is the scope of sensors? What is the scope of sensors? For example, is real-time data input from personal on the tablet part of this level? It was on the... Um, on the um, yeah, 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 I get it now. Um, so... Okay. Yeah, um, if it's connected, I would say that's also just another sensor. For me, sensors are not limited to, uh, to uh, I think human are also sensors, just like the ERP system is a kind of sensor. 
but yeah, let's not go into model two things. For me, it's about having connected data across the factory. Okay, um, we have further questions from Roland Willman. Um, so digital twin is a summary, summarizing term for every non-application, manufacturing execution system, process control system, etc. Yeah, so I think this is the, 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 the uh, we've had this discussion a lot of times. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can relate to this question. Um, I hope you've seen that the digital twin is actually a model and the model is used in applications. So if you can use a model in your applications, then you can use the digital twin because digital twin and model are the kind of similar things. Uh, I'm just stating that currently we call model digital twin and currently this model can do more than it could do 10 years ago. And that's why we have a difference. And for me, the model is linked to actual data. So if we just have a model without any data, for me, it's less of a digital twin um, uh, than if you have one with actual data. And it's also a new way of combining, linking uh, a data model and business process. I, I think that's it creates new possibilities of creating applications. And so, yes, it's every known uh, application in manufacturing. Uh, but at the same time, no, it's also not every known application in manufacturing. And that's the complicated part. And I hope it's clear that if you do something with a model that uses data and uses new IT technology, and then we're talking about digital twins. And if you're just using your manufacturing execution system, that's not a digital twin by itself. Ah, yes. So then I see the next question. So design applications, virtual prototype versus digital twin. For me, there is no difference. But um, others like to say, um, no, no, it's a virtual prototype. That's not a digital twin. I've had cases where there wasn't actual, actually a physical product where we used the virtual prototype to create synthetic data and then trained a model using the synthetic data to pre predict something for the actual physical product later on. Um, so for me, then it's kind of curious in terms of, ah, is that just a virtual prototype? No, it's not just a virtual prototype, um, but it's also not just a digital twin. So there, it's kind of vague. I don't like to make it too specific or too narrow. Uh, SIM strategy. Um, someone will have to help me there. Mr. Wilman, this is the, your question. Maybe you can uh, tell it directly. You can unmute yourself and you can explain your question to you. <coughs> Yeah, the, the question is, uh, because your seven steps model um, about, let's say, the digital twin strategy um, reminds me a lot on the computer integrated manufacturing strategy of enterprises. Also there, it's uh, important to have the overall strategy of the enterprise's business in mind uh, and then to plan all the integration of processes, of information models, uh, of pro in, in a holistic way um, from the planning side, but also from the from the um, measured data side, so from the process data side. So it, it, it reminds me somehow in, in the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of similar. Yes, yes. Okay. And that's I, it. Thank you. I, I would you. also say that this, this seven step is not just limited to manufacturing. Uh, I, I've done this seven steps also for telco operators or for farms and for exactly. other aspects, right? It's not just, it's just a generic way of looking at it in a more holistic way. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I've talked about the prototype digital twin, yeah. Um, there is also two questions from Francesca. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would say that if you have a simulation doing something that is usually already a digital twin. Um, the question is, are you using data in your simulation or is it just the simulation? And how are you using the outputs? So um, how's the, the, the feedback loop from your simulation going back into the digital twin? I think that's those are big parts differentiating, let's say, plain old simulation with the new digital twinning way of, of thinking. Um, which are technologies enabling, yeah, so that's also for the talk for tomorrow. Um, and also in the talk in the afternoon from perspective, I think that would be a, a great perspective uh, uh, on say, seeing how technology enables digital twins. And also Jotne has some good examples there. Um, yes. The session just... Ah, the level of investment. Ah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so that this ties to your purpose again. If your purpose is small, and hopefully your investment would also be small, uh, because if to go from your entire manufacturing to from level two to three, that's a significant effort. It's that's not easily done. Um, but if you keep the scope small, it's doable, and you can also show value quite easily. Um, and then if you've shown the value, then the, the next step in having the next machine connected or the next production line or the next product is easier than uh, if you have to do everything at once. I don't think that's feasible. And time uh, for re return investment, I think that can be quite quick. Uh, so, for example, I had a company asking me, um, we think there's slack in the, in the production planning, but we have no clue because our machines are not connected. So, step one, can we connect the machines? Can we have the right metrics from the machine so that we know which order they are working on, um, what, their, what their actual usage is, and how the process of the manufacturing links together with this can we then generate reports and that can be done in a month or two three uh, to make that actually happen and then you actually have new insights saying ah we actually see the machine is not operational 20 percent of the time it's because um, uh, there is a change over time or it's because the material is not uh, sufficiently there uh, there, you need to find the cause, of course, that's manual work. And uh, they discovered that they have repeat orders that they can place in between other orders so they can actually use up more machine time. And But without having the insight on both machine times and both the order recurrence and matching these two with each other, they wouldn't have be, been able to do it. And then the question is, can we automate the whole planning process to deal with these kind of things and and not have someone make up a planning uh, in Excel.